So good afternoon. I'm Amy Myers, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2023 Assessment and Accountability Information Meeting Series from the California Department of Education, or as we like to call it, the AIM. Today is the first day of our three-part series. We will be here every Thursday afternoon, ending on August 17th. Today, we will have our director's message, national and international studies, the PFT, high school equivalency exams, updates across assessment programs, the CSA, and ELA and mathematics. Before we hand it off to our very knowledgeable presenters, we want to address a few housekeeping items. First, all participants are muted. We will be collecting questions through a Google form today. Uh, the link has been dropped into the chat, but I'm going to drop it in one more time for you. Um, please submit any questions that you might have there, and the presenters will do their best to answer all of your questions at the end of the presentations today. A link to the copy of today's note-taking guide was sent to you via email, and if you haven't received it or need access to it again, the URL has also been placed in the chat box. Uh, selecting the URL will take you to a folder where you can download the notes. You will have access to the PowerPoints used today as well. They will be uploaded to that same folder where the notes are at the end of today's meeting uh, so that you'll have the most up-to-date version of the PowerPoint. We will be recording today's presentation and an archive of this presentation will be available on the CASP.org CASP Asynchronous Training Opportunities page. It usually takes one to two weeks after the meeting uh, for this recording to be available. So I'm going to go ahead and drop those links into the chat one more time for all of you, and then let's get started. To start off this informational meeting series, please welcome the Director of the Assessment Development and Administration Division, Dr. Mao Vang, and Cheryl Cotton, Deputy Superintendent of Public Instruction and Measurement Branch at the California Department of Education. It's all yours. Thank you, Amy. Welcome everyone to the Assessment and Accountability Information Meeting Series. As Amy said, I'm Cheryl Cotton, Deputy Superintendent of the Instruction, Measurement and Administration Branch at the California Department of Education, or CDE. Thank you for your hard work in testing over 4 million students on our statewide assessments last year. We have not completed all of our scoring and reporting and the testing cycle is already here again. So thank you. Next slide, please. Today's agenda. In this session, we will introduce you to the meeting series and highlight the 2022-23 test results release process for the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress, or CASP, and the English Language Assessments for California, the LPAC. Next slide. Today's meeting will cover the following. We'll do our welcomes and talk about our test release results process. We'll talk about national and international tests, our California high school equivalency and proficiency programs, and the physical fitness test, our cross program updates for CASP and LPAC, our California Spanish assessment, and our English language arts and literacy, I'm sorry, English language arts, literacy, and mathematics. Next slide, please. For the upcoming meetings, on August 10th, we will cover the interim assessments, LPAC, and California Science Test, or CAST. And then on August 17th, we will provide updates on the California School Dashboard and accountability. Now, throughout this meeting series, department staff will share updates and changes to our assessment and accountability systems that we hope you find helpful. Now, I will turn it over to Mao Vang, to cover the 2022-23 test results release process. Mel? Thank you, Cheryl. I'm Mel Vang, a director of the Assessment Development and Administration Division at the CDE. Um, the department releases test results uh, to local educational agencies um, in the following ways, through the Test Operations Management System, or TOMS, and the California Educator Reporting System, or SIRS. Uh, you also receive student score data files 
and through the local systems for your uh, local systems uh, for parents or and guardians. Um, through aggregate results, uh, through the preview process, and then publicly uh, released data. So the specific dates, results are available to uh, local educational agencies for each assessment is provided in the note-taking guide. The results available in TOMS and SIRS are partial and may not include all the um, local educational agencies' final results. You may share those results with your local governing board, though, and, and your local staff for local planning purposes. Next slide. Um, as a result of a new functionality of the CASP uh, student score data file, um, not all enrolled students will be present in the file until all results have been reporting. So due to this change, um, there will no longer be a CASP preview of the preliminary aggregate results as we've done in previous years. There will be one, oh, excuse me, there will be one CASP and LPAC preview period in October to verify all the aggregate data on the test results uh, for California's assessments website. After all scoring and reporting is completed, a letter announcing the preview schedule with the login information will be sent to coordinators. And once the preview period is over or has been conducted and all data have been confirmed, the CDE will provide a timeline for the release of statewide results to the public. Thank you for, um, uh, and we welcome you again to this session of the um, assessment and accountability meeting series. I will uh, hand the presentation back to Amy. Thank you so much, Mao and Cheryl. Uh, the next section, uh, we are going to hear about what's new in the world of national and international tests. Julie Williams, National and International Assessment Coordinator from the CDE, from the CDE is actually in Washington, D.C. today. Um, with her duties uh, with the NAEP organization, um, but she's recorded her presentation uh, to share with you today. So I'm going to go ahead and play that for you. Now it's time for an update on the national and international studies planned for the upcoming school year. These are all representative studies, meaning that a sample of schools are selected to represent the diversity of California and the nation. Each of these programs rely upon a site coordinator who may be a school or district person. Let's start with an update for the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP. This is a relatively big year for NAEP. Over 800 California public schools from over 300 school districts have been selected to represent California and the nation. For most schools, NAEP will randomly select about 50 students. NAEP grade four and eight math and reading assessments are required for schools in districts that accept Title I funds. If your district or school was selected for NAEP 2024, I've already notified you. For school year 23-24, NAEP will assess students in grades 4, 8, and 12. Assessment subjects include mathematics and reading in all three grades and science in grade 8 only. Each selected student takes part of the NAEP test in a single subject and responds to a short survey about their educational experiences. NAEP takes students about two hours and the assessment window is January 29th through March 8th, 2024. NAEP will also conduct two special studies, a high school transcript study and the National Indian Education Study. All schools selected for grade 12 NAEP will be asked to participate in the high school transcript study, which asks schools to submit course catalogs this fall 
and transcripts for about 15 students per school after the end of the school year. These can be su submitted online or hard copy. The National Indian Education Study gathers data from students identified as Native American with a, an additional short survey after they take NAEP. So what's new for NAEP 2024? First, NAEP has a new assessment management system that replaces the legacy My NAEP for Schools site. It looks different and has some powerful new tools. Next, NAEP will ask to use school-provided internet, if possible. If not possible, NAEP will use their own mobile hotspots as they have for years. To ensure access to a school's internet, NAEP will need a school technology coordinator. This can be someone at the school or district level. Lastly, NAEP is now providing and using Chromebooks in addition to the Microsoft Surface Pros they've used in the past. Students across the country are much more familiar with using Chromebooks. So these are the most frequently asked questions about NAEP. First, how are schools selected? So NAEP specifically selects a sample of schools to represent the diversity of our state and nation in terms of school size, urbanicity or location, demographics, and achievement. School selection is not random. How does NAEP select students? From the list of selected schools, NAEP wants to give every student an equal chance to take NAEP. In November, here at the CDE, we will pull student lists from CalPads of all currently enrolled students and submit them to NAEP. NAEP then orders that list by last name and selects each nth student to generate the desired sample size. So to get a sample of 50 from a list of 100 students, NAEP would select every other student. So how do we notify parents? NAEP will provide a parent letter template for school coordinators to use to notify parents of all selected students. This template is currently available in English and Spanish, and if you need an additional language translation, just ask. When can I see the results? Well, Results for the 2024 NAEP will be released in early 2025 as the nation's report card. We'll see state and national results for grade 12, excuse me, grade four and eight math and reading, and soon thereafter, national results for grade eight science and grade 12 math and reading. NAEP never releases school or student level results. NAEP does release district results for just two large urban districts in California, Los Angeles and San Diego Unified School Districts, who participate in the NAEP Trial Urban District Assessment, or TUDA, program. Now let's talk about the two international studies coming to California in the spring of 2024. These studies compare teaching and learning in the United States to other countries around the world. Sample sizes in California are relatively small, with between 10 and 30 California public schools selected for each. Stay tuned for notifications from me if your district or, or school are selected for these. The first is the Teaching and Learning International Survey, or TALIS. TALIS is an online survey of principals and teachers in schools that serve grades 7, 8, or 9. TALIS is aimed at better understanding the successes and challenges faced by teachers and school leaders. TALIS includes questions about respondents' backgrounds, work environments, professional development, beliefs and attitudes about teaching, and pedagogical knowledge. 
TALIS is administered every five years and takes principals about 45 minutes and teachers about 60 minutes to complete. The second is a field test for the Program for International Student Assessment, or PISA. PISA is conducting a field test of new items to prepare for its 2025 operational assessment. PISA surveys 15-year-old students and measures their performance on tasks and items in mathematics, reading, science, and a new learning in a digital world assessment. PISA takes students about four hours, including instructions, breaks, and a questionnaires. Both of these international studies are planned for spring 2024. So links to contacting us are available in the note-taking guide. And let us answer your questions at the Q&A session. Thank you for attending this update on national and international studies in California. All right. Now, please welcome Don Kilmer, Manager of the Proficiency, Equivalency, and Fitness Testing Office. Don, it's all yours. Thanks, Amy. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I hope everyone is having a great day. My name is Don Kilmer. I'm the State Administrator for the California High School Equivalency and Proficiency Programs, as well as the Physical Fitness Test. For today's agenda, I will be sharing information and updates for the following assessments. The California High School Equivalency, or HSE, which includes the GED and HiSET tests, and the proficiency programs, as well as the California Physical Fitness Test, or PFT. In the next few slides, I'll provide a quick overview of the programs in my office, mention the two vendors used in, the Califor in California for the equivalency exams, talked about the difference in subtests for each vendor, who is eligible to take the exams and what the testing options or modes for administration are. To begin the equivalency program, the GED first appeared in 1943. The GED was created by the American Council for the Education, or ACE, uh, near the conclusion of World War II to assist military personnel and veterans who had, not complete, who had completed their service but not yet completed high school. The GED program provides or provided them with um, uh, an opportunity to demonstrate their knowledge and skills at the level equivalent to a high school graduate. In, uh, in 2014, California added the use of the HiSET test as an approved equi equivalency exam. And in 2022, the HiSET underwent an ownership change and changed from ETS to PSI. In case you didn't catch this in the previous slide, California uses two vendors to offer our equivalency tests, the GED testing service and PSI, which provides the high set test. The CDE is fortunate to have two options for the California test takers because some states only have one vendor. Each vendor ha of, has an equivalency subtest divided differently. GED has four subtests, and combines reading and writing portions into one subtest, while the high set separates the reading and writing into two separate tests, resulting in five subtests. The other three subtests are the same, mathematics, social studies, and science. In the next slide, I'll go over the various testing options. When choosing to take a high school equivalency exam, or HSE, test takers have two options. With the inclusion of virtual or at home testing, the equivalency tests have become even more convenient. Test takers can either take a test in person at a testing center near their home or work, or they can take the test now at home via live proctoring 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, as long as their environment meets the approved guidelines. An additional option for high set test takers who prefer paper tests 
um, over a computer testing option is to take the high set paper pencil test in a testing center. Currently, high set is the only vendor offering paper pencil based tests. The eligibility requirements for the programs are quite simply that a person is not currently enrolled in high school and would have graduated from high school had they remained and followed the usual course of study towards graduation. The age requirement for equivalency program states a person must be 18 years of age or at least 17 years of age and either credit deficient, meaning less than 100 units or credit, or confined to an institution or correctional facility. This information can be found in Education Code 51420, also included in your note-taking guide. And lastly, the equivalency program does have a California residency requirement. To find acceptable proof of residency, please use the link provided in your note-taking guide. Valuable HSE resources, including eligibility, accommodations, practice test, and testing locations can be found on the California of Education's website, the GED website, and the HiSET website. All of these links are provided in your note-taking guide. Now on to the California High School Proficiency Program. In the next few slides, I'll be sharing a quick overview of the programs the two vendors use in California for the exam, the difference in subtests for each vendor who is eligible to take the tests, the modes or options of testing, what are considered passing scores, and what options are available to students after passing the exam. Now uh, for an overview of the proficiency program. What happened to the California to the California High School Proficiency Exam, also known as the Chesapeake? The Chesapeake was a paper pencil exam implemented in 1974 to help students that were either excelling or struggling in high school exit high school. The test was open to students 16 years of age or if they were currently enrolled in the second semester of their sophomore year. The students could take the test in order to demonstrate their proficiency in English language arts and mathematics. Once the student passed the exam, they could choose to exit high school with a parent or guardian's approval to begin attending higher education or begin a career. To clarify, Chespi was an exam that went through various stages of iterations. The last exam that CDE had, the, had been utilizing was the Stanford uh, Achievement Test 10th edition, known as the SAT-10, published by Pearson. Because this test is now retired, the CD is partnering with high school equivalency vendors to utilize language arts and mathematics subtest to implement a new proficiency program. The new proficiency program will begin testing on the new HSE platforms this fall. As I just mentioned, the proficiency program will now utilize the language arts and mathematics subtests of the HSE to deliver the proficiency exams. For each vendor, the subtests are broken down like this. When using the GED for proficiency exam, there will be two subtests, reading, reading, writing, and mathematics. When HiSET is being used for proficiency, there are three subtests, reading, writing, and mathematics. Next, I will go over the eligibility requirements for the proficiency exam. A student is eligible for the proficiency program if they are currently enrolled in high school. Let me repeat that. A student is eligible for the proficiency exam if they are currently enrolled in high school and they have been enrolled in grade 10 for one school year or longer. This applies to students that are credit deficient and unable to move forward to the second semester or, um, um, of their uh, 10th grade year, or if the student is currently enrolled in the second semester of their 10th grade year. Two, if a student is 16 years of age. And three, there is no state equivalency, uh, state residency requirement for the proficiency program. Next, I'll go into more detail on the testing delivery modes for the exams. Students will be able to choose a vendor and register for the particular subtest they would like to take. Once they've registered, these are the different modes of testing. 
Individuals can choose to take a paper and pencil or a computer-based test in a testing center. They also may choose to take the test at home on their personal computer through live proctoring. Students will need to ensure that they can, uh, can create a distraction-free environment to take the exam at home and must have a reliable internet connection. Remember, CD is going to be using the same test, GED and HiSET, for the two separate programs, proficiency and equivalency. The only difference between the two programs is the passing scores required. Both vendors have college and career readiness cut scores. And in the case of the proficiency exam, the expectation is to leave high school college and career ready. Because of this, the proficiency exam requires a minimum single subtest score of at least 165 if you're using the GED or 15 if you're using the high set per subtest. The equivalency exam only requires a minimum single subtest score of at least 145 if you're using GED and eight if you're using high set per subtest. Notice that the proficiency cut scores are higher than the equivalency exams cut scores because these individuals taking the proficiency exam are currently enrolled in high school and they need to demonstrate that they are proficient in language arts and mathematics in order to exit high school. For equivalency, the expectation is to demonstrate performance equal to the standard of performance expected of high school graduates. Next, I'll be talking about the options and benefits for students after passing the proficiency program. After a student has passed the proficiency exam, they will be given options of how to proceed. They can choose to either remain enrolled in high school and take classes at their junior college or exit high school with a parent or guardian's permission to begin attending higher education or begin their career. And if after uh, passing the exams, they are interested in exiting high school and regardless of their age, they can take the remaining high school equivalency test to earn their high school uh, certificate, which opens up even more doors. Our partnership with the HSE vendors to administer the proficiency and equivalency exams create the following benefits for our test takers. They will have access to testing 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. They will have access to free prep materials offered by each of the vendors on their websites. Links are provided in the note-taking guide. The exams are aligned to college and career readiness anchor standards. The certificate, proficiency, the certificate for proficiency is accepted in all California junior colleges, California state universities, and Universities of California. The Certificate for Equivalency is accepted across the United States and internationally. I would like to share a resource that is available to homeless and foster youth that applies to both proficiency and equivalency exams. There are fee waivers provided for each vendor for individuals that are under the age of 25 and have been either homeless or a foster youth. That means these individuals can qualify to take the exam for free. For more information on how to apply for a free waiver, please contact your office or use the link in your note-taking guide to uh, the informational flyer available there. New data collection requirements are now being held for homeless and foster youth. We would like to include, encourage test takers to please collect this information at the time of registration. It is currently an optional field. However, both vendors will soon be adding this field as a requirement when registering for testing. In the next few slides, I'll be providing a quick overview of the California Physical Fitness Test, the report to the legislature and the state superintendent's recommendations, as well as results and reporting. In 1996, the fitness gram was designated by the State Board of Education as the required physical fitness test that school districts uh, are to administer, the PFT as it's referred. 
is administered between February 1 and May 31st to students in grades 5, 7, and 9. Students' results are presented by the administrator orally or in writing to the, test, to the student at the time of testing, and it is optional for the LEAs to share those results with the parents. The PFT legislative report, which you will find in your, uh, a link to which you will find in your note-taking guide, the report um, was authorized in September 2020 through Senate Bill 820, Chapter 110, Statutes of 2020, Section 68, which requires the Superintendent of Public Construction to submit a report with recommendations regarding the purpose and administration of the physical performance test as indicated. The full PFT report for the physical performance test presented to the legislature, the Department of Finance, and the State Board of Education can be found um, on the legislative report's website or a link of which is available in your note taking guide. Students should be provided with their raw scores either orally or in writing, as I mentioned before. Local education agencies or LEAs are required to report participation results by fitness area and grade in their school accountability report card for SARC. LEAs are no longer required to keep their students' physical performance test scores in their cumulative file. The 2022-2023 SARC template was approved by the State Board in July of 2023 meeting. Any changes uh, to the physical fitness test will require legislative action. Until then, please keep administering the PFT in accordance with the changes implemented during the 2022-2023 school year. I thank you for your time and attention. Have a great day and back to you, Amy. Thank you so much, Don. Next, we're going to hear from Devin Triplett and Judy Yang, Education Programs Consultants from the Assessment Development and Administration Division to share some updates across assessment programs. All right, Devin and Judy, you're up. Thanks, Amy. Uh, thanks all again uh, for taking your time out of the, uh, today to uh, join this meeting. Um, I'm gonna, again, my name is Devin Triplett. I'm with the English and Math Office in the Assessment Division. Um, please do not hesitate to send any questions our way. Um, but with that being said, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I will be sharing some updates that apply to the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress, CASP, and English Language Proficiency Assessments for California, also known as LPEC. Okay, so our agenda today includes uh, policy updates, system updates, uh, reporting updates, accessib accessibility resources updates, uh, as well as apportionment info and reminders about the Golden State SEAL Merit Diploma. Uh, first, with um, our, our policy updates, uh, our first policy update uh, regards the um, Tom's role of the primary local educational agency or LEA coordinator. Um, starting with the 23-24 school year, the individual with the TOMS role of superintendent must designate a primary LEA coordinator for both CASP and LPAC. So previously they had to designate, the superintendent had to designate an LEA coordinator. Now they will designate a primary LEA coordinator. Uh, the, the primary uh, LEA coordinator serves as the main point of contact for ETS. If a primary coordinator is not designated, then the first LEA coordinator created will automatically be designated as the primary coordinator. The LEA superintendent uh, can always update the primary coordinator in TOMS as needed. And once a primary coordinator is designated, the primary coordinator along with the superintendent can add or delete additional LEA, CASP or LPAC um, LEA coordinators in TOMS. Uh, our next topic is the alternate assessment decision confirmation worksheet. Uh, the CDE is pleased to announce our new alternate assessment decision uh, decision making wor uh, worksheet. Excuse me, I'll say that again. We're pleased to announce our new alternate assessment decision making worksheet. Uh, this is designed designed to guide and support individual 
Individualized Education Program, or IEP, teams with a step-by-step -step process to determine whether the California Alternate Assessments, or CAAs, and the Alternate LPAC are the most appropriate assessments for an individual student with the most significant cognitive disabilities. This decision worksheet has four parts. Uh, part A is um, con uh, concerns eligibility determination based on disability category. Part B includes a step-by-step -step decision points for each of the three domains, conceptual, social, and practical. And Part C includes tools to determine if the student requires direct individualized instruction aligned with the standards, including extended and substantial supports. Finally, Part D is consideration of any additional concerns and certification of the decision on whether or not the student is eligible to participate in alternate assessments. Now, a student must meet all of the criteria in parts A, B, and C outlined in the worksheet to be eligible for the alternate assessments. And just a reminder that if a student is assigned the alternate assessment in one subject area, they should be assigned the alternate assessment in other subject areas and programs as well. And TOMS will automatically mark the alternate assessment or register the student for the alternate assessment um, uh, if they are registered for one alternate assessment. The only exception to this is the initial LPAC and initial alternate LPAC. So we're going to move on now to systems updates regarding the test operations management system, TOMS, as well as the teacher hand scoring system, uh, THSS. Our first TOMS update is regarding the student score data file. Now this is available to CASP and LEA coordinators in TOMS, and it provides LEA score results for all students who tested within a particular test administration, as well as demographic information for each student. LEA coordinators can generate the report by tested LEA, which will include all students who tested in the LEA, or by enrolled LEA, which will include all students enrolled in the LEA at the time of running the report. This information can be used to upload student results, results to your student information system or your SIS. Now, based on feedback we received from LEAs, a change has been made to the CASP student score data file so that it is now updated daily. The by enrolled LEA report type of the student score data file will now include assessment uh, uh, records for all currently enrolled students, including enrolled students who completed testing at a different LEA and are now with your LEA. Information about the changes and its impacts to available data can be found on the 2022-23 Changes to CAS Student Score Data File webpage, and this link has been provided in your note-taking guide. Now, due to the change to the student score data file, this change I just explained, the LEA preview of results for the test results for California's assessments website will be held after all tests have been scored and reported. And as our director Malvang said earlier, this will occur in October. LEAs will have more time during this preview to review the results and verify the information on the results website prior to the public re release of results scheduled for this fall. Now, um, prior to the release of CASP and LPAC student results, so the results that are available in TOMS and in the California Educator Reporting System, or SIRS, may be partial until all results have been, all tests have been scored and reported. Um, so the partial results may be shared with your local governing board and your LEA staff for the purposes of local planning. On to our next update, effective exit date. Now, for both the CASP and the LPAC, the effective exit date will now uh, be used instead of the actual date the exit took place in the California Longitudinal Pupil Achievement Data System, also known as CALPADS. So if the effective exit date is prior to the test window start date and the student has not yet started testing, then the student's test registration is removed from TOMS, and this is already reflected in 22-23 data. We have received many inquiries uh, regarding this in the past from LEAs about students that were exited after the window opened, but the student test registration remained active in TOMS, and we received many uh, requests to please change this. Again, previously retroactive exits entered in CalPADS after the opening of the LEA testing window would not be removed. A student registration was only removed if the student exit was entered in CalPADS prior to the opening of the LEA testing window. Now students who have not started testing and the effective exit date is and uh, and the effective exit date is prior to the window opening. They will have their registration removed. <clears throat> 
excuse me. We're going to talk a little bit about STAIRS uh, or the Security and Test Administration Incident Reporting System. Um, so now on to STAIRS. The STAIRS process in TOMS must be used to report and resolve testing incidents that occur during the administration of the CASP and the LPAC. Um, the STAIRS process is not used for interim assessments. There are three types of testing incidents reported in STAIRS. The first type are breaches. Breaches occur when secure materials are exposed outside of the testing environment. These circumstances have external implications for the test. For example, uh, a breach would include test items being shared on social media or some other website. The second type uh, is an irregularity. An irregularity is an unusual circumstance that impacts an individual student or a group of students' performance on the test or impacts test security or test validity. Examples of irregularities are students who were assigned an incorrect designated support or accommodation or students who may have cheated on the assessment. And the third type is an impropriety. An impropriety is, is an unusual circumstance that has low impact on an individual student or a group of students' performance on the test or of impacting test security or test validity. Examples of improprieties during a test session could be a disruption, such as a fire drill or an internet out, uh, outage. So uh, for CASP only, the, this next part is regarding for CASP and it has to do with invalidates. Uh, when an appeal is submitted in STAIRS to invalidate a student's test for a given reason. Uh, when that test is, uh, when that STAIRS appeal is approved by the CDE and the test is invalidated, the student will not have access to that test anymore. They will be locked out of that test. They can still continue with other tests. So for example, if a student uh, is, is caught cheating on an ELAPT, um, the coordinator submits an appeal to have that ELAPT invalidated. Uh, the CDE approves it, the student is locked out of that ELAPT, however, they can continue with the ELA CAT, they can continue with the math test and all the other um, CASP and LPAC assessments as, as eligible. Um, examples of security incidents that lead to invalidation include student cheating, like I mentioned, using an unauthorized device or adult issues such as providing students with answers. Now, invalidated results for the CASP um, uh, those tests will be scored and the scores will be provided on the student score report with a note that the results should be used with caution as the test was administered under conditions that may not represent the student's achievement. The student will be counted as participating in the calculation of the school's accountability par uh, participation um, on the California School Dashboard. Now, some LEAs reached out during 22-23 to inquire about reversing invalidations that were previously requested by the LEA. Um, and, and, and we just want to confirm that there are no reversals of invalidates unless an invalidation was requested for an incorrect SSID. Um, for, but so for any other reasons, uh, we will not be able to reverse invalidates. So please be sure to confirm uh, before submitting these appeals. Now, uh, a reminder about STAIRS as well. Um, it is very important to remember that if a student encounters a technical issue while testing, uh, please stop testing, have the student stop testing and do not allow the student to continue until the issue is resolved. This could include situations where the student perceives that the test delivery system is not functioning properly. Uh, for, for example, maybe the embedded calculator is not appearing or they think the test is skipping questions on them. It could also be other technology issues uh, that might be able to be resolved at the school site or that might require reaching out to the LEA success agent. So in some cases, uh, a STAIRS case may need to be filed. For example, a technical issue beyond the control of a test administrator or test examiner may cause the 20 minute pause rule to expire. Um, and it, uh, an incident that might cause this could be a fire drill or an internet outage. Now the LEA can file a STAIRS case to request an appeal to allow the students to revisit previously answered questions. In all those situations, it's important that when the issue occurs to have the student uh, stop testing right then and there. Um, there have been instances of um, uh, TAs having students finish the test, thinking they can submit an appeal and have the student go back, but these appeals will not be granted because at that point the student has seen the whole test. Um, so if, if a student encounters a technical issue, 
have the student stop until the technical issue is resolved. Okay, I'm gonna move on and talk about enhancements to the teacher hand scoring system. Now the teacher hand scoring system or THSS will be enhanced for the 22, 23, 24 test administration year. And updates include improved navigation and communication features. Uh, the enhanced THSS will be used to enter scores for the initial LPAC, Smarter Balanced Interim Assessments for ELA and Mathematics, and the Interim Assessments for the California Science Test, or CAST, and LPAC. The enhanced THSS will now display the student count and pending items to be scored for each assessment. The THSS scoring view is now at the assessment level and not at the item level. The test scoring view becomes available once an assessment is selected. Then all the pending scores can be entered for each selected student. Being able to enter scores this way means that an educator can navigate the system with more ease and reduce the likelihood of missing an assessment for a student. The scorer can select a student and then score all the needed items for that student rather than a view that displays each item for each student appearing as a row. And also reassignment can occur at this point as well. Only non-submitted students can be reassigned. To reassign a student under the assign column, select the student you wish to re reassign to another scorer. A note is automatically generated when a test is reassigned. Now the new scorer can score the missing scores or rescore completed items if requested by the assigner in the notes box in the interface. So now from the student score screen, you can toggle between a student's items to enter any scores pending for that student or to change a score. You can select different students to score on a specific item, and this allows the scorer to focus on one item at a time. And you can enter scoring notes that can be seen by any user assigned to the task. And please remember the system will only accept a submission for a student when all their items have been scored. And we're gonna move on to our next slide in our next, uh, next section uh, regarding reporting updates. So we are excited to share the status of our 22, 23, 24 CASP and LPAC SSR redesign. Now the goals of the redesign are to improve the reporting of test results provided to students and parents or guardians that include actionable information, as well as to provide students and parents or guardians with timely access to test results while minimizing the distribution efforts for local educational agencies. The timeline for this process has been as follows. From September 2022 to January 2023, ETS developed concept design options and conducted formal focus groups. And from February uh, 2023 to, to July 2023, ETS prepared mock-ups and the CDE gathered feedback from interest holders as well as the State Board of Education or SBE. From July to August 2023, ETS and the CDE collaborated and are collaborating using interest holders feedback on design options and preparing sample SSRs for the September board meeting. And coming up in September, the CDE will present the recommended SSR revisions at the September board meeting for the SBE's approval. And in uh, spring 2024, the CDE will release redesigned SSRs for the 2023-24 CASP and LPAC summative assessments. In July 2024, the CDE will release redesigned SSRs for the initial LPAC and the initial alternate LPAC for the 2024-25 administration. Now, all proposed revisions to CASP and LPAC SSRs originate from feedback gathered from parents, guardians, students, educators, and interest holders. Um, throughout all proposed CASP and LPAC SSR revisions, efforts have been made to reduce the amount of text and to improve the clarity of language so that all SSRs are clear, concise, and informative to all students, parents, and guardians. Separate focus groups were formed from parents, students, educators, and interest holders respectively to help us with the redesign. The initial concept designs received positive feedback across all focus groups, especially with the score history section and the re-inclusion of school and state averages. Other additions to the redesign SSR, uh, SSRs include a student's lexile and quantile measures included on the ELA and math uh, SSR, eliminating the need for a separate lexile and quantile report, 
as well as the addition of the Writing Extended Response, or WER, score for students who take the Smarter Balanced Summative Assessment in, in ELA. Now, the Writing Extended Response, as many of you know, is uh, the, the writing task as part of the ELA performance task. Some people even refer to it as the essay question. SSRs will be available in PDF as well as HTML format. The addition of HTML will facilitate the access and viewing of electronic SSRs through a greater variety of devices, including mobile. There are also planned updates to the Starting Smarter website and other parent resources. These changes will reinforce parent understanding of the CASP and LPAC assessments while also better supporting parents in interpreting student results and connecting them with resources. A detailed description of all proposed changes and reporting enhancements can be found in the June Memorandum to the State Board of Education. So that is all detailed in the June memo to the SBE. Now, similar to the CAS, the goal for the, for the redesign of the LPAC SSRs was to improve the reporting of test results and provide timely access to results for parents and families. Um, more targeted revisions to the LPAC SSR include updated informational language about the LPAC, as well as updated language about the use of scores and an overall reorganization of the score. Um, score is how they're displayed on the SSR. The first page of the LPAC SSR includes information about what the summative LPAC is and what the scores mean. It also includes students' overall summative LPAC scores, as well as a link to the Starting Smarter website, where parents can access more information about a student's score. The second page of the LPAC SSR will include the student's score history, as well as the student's scores on the oral language and written language domains, which has been reorganized based on feedback uh, from focus groups and other interest holders. Finally, similar to the CAS, the LPAC SSRs will be accessible in HTML format as well as PDF. We hope the redesign of the SSRs will provide parents and families with timely and clear information to their students' CASP and LPAC results. And finally, I am going to provide an uh, update on our test results for California's assessments website. Now, two new student groups are now included or will be included with this year's release of the test results for California's assessments website. And these two new student groups will be available for both CASP and LPAC programs. The first student group is Long-Term English Learner, also known as LTEL. And this is an English learner. Uh, this includes English learner students who have been enrolled in a U.S. school for six years or more and have not been reclassified, reclassified as fluent English proficient. The second student group to be added is at risk of becoming a uh, long-term English learner or at risk of becoming LTEL. Sometimes you also see it as RTEL or RRLTEL, excuse me. Uh, and this includes English learner students who have been enrolled in schools in the United States for four to five years and have not been reclassified. For more information, please see Education Code 313.1 in your note-taking guide. Now, the list of students that qualify for these groups was provided to CalPADS coordinators by the Analysis, Measurement, and Reporting Division through the Student Online Accountability Record Status System in May and in June. For the LPAC, the summative alternate LPAC will have change over time data, and a new tile will be added to the webpage for the initial L uh, alternate LPAC. So those are two updates for the LPAC program on the website as well. Thank you all for your time. I will now pass, uh, pass it off to my colleague, Judy Yang, who will discuss updates surrounding the accessibility resources. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. My name is Judy Yang, and I work. I also work for the ELA and math office. Next slide. The California assessment system provides a full range of assessment resources for all students, including those who are English learners and students with disabilities. These resources are known as test settings to ensure that the needs of all students are met when taking the assessments. Available on all CAS and LPAC assessments are accessibility resources that are embedded and non-embedded. Embedded resources are digitally delivered as part of the technology platform for the computer-based tests, such as text-to-speech for math and science. Non-embedded resources are available when provided by the LEA. For example, a non-embedded resource that can be provided to a student outside of the test delivery system are noise buffers. There are four types of resources. Universal tools, which are available to all students, such as scratch paper. Designated supports that are available to any students with an educator recommendation, such as read aloud. And accommodations, such as speech to text, which are only available to students with an active IEP and 5-4 plan. Lastly, we have unlisted resources, which I will discuss some more in the next slides.
But first, let's talk about the matrix. The California Assessment Accessibility Resource Matrix, also known as the matrix, is a document that lists all the universal tools, business supports, and accommodations for CAS and LPAC. You'll want to be familiar with this document. In fact, all educators and support staff who provide student instruction should be familiar with this document. It describes each possible resource that is available for use. Any student using a universal tool, a designated support, or an accommodation from the matrix will receive a valid test score, and there's no penalty to the LEA for providing these resources. It is important that all your site staff know this. To repeat, the universal tools, the use of universal tools, designated supports, and accommodation does not affect a student test score in any way because all these resources types do not change the construct of what is being tested. In addition, accessibility resources exist to provide equitable access to students. Therefore, assigning resources on a global scale, either on principle or for, or for simplicity's sake, is not the intention of the accessibility resources. For example, if all EL students at level one and two were assigned Spanish stack translations for math, this will cause the test directions to also come up in Spanish, which would be confusing for students who are not proficient in reading Spanish. Successful use of accessibility resources requires that the educational team make decisions regarding supports to use on a student-by-student -student basis. Accessibility resources must be assigned in advance to give students the opportunity to practice the resource during daily instruction and classroom assessments prior to seeing the CAS or LPAC. You'll find more information regarding accessibility resources in your note-taking guide. These documents are great resources and we recommend that you keep a copy handy at all times. Now let's say a student receives a support in class that's listed in their active IEP or section 504, but that resource is not listed as a universal tool, doesn't support or accommodation in the matrix. We call these unlisted resources because these accessibility resources are not currently identified for use on the CAS or LPAC. Unlisted resources are rare and it's likely the resources are already listed. So before you submit a request for an unlisted resource, first check the accessibility, California accessibility matrix to confirm the resource is truly unlisted. For example, breaks in communicative devices for amplification are listed in the matrix and do not need to be requested as an unlisted resource. Once you confirm the resource is unlisted, the test site coordinator must submit a request to the California Department of Education through TOMS a minimum of 10 business days before the student's first day of testing. The CD will review the requested support and the approval will be granted by the CD based on the IEP's team and or Section 504 plans designation and only if the unlisted resource does not compromise the test security. Some unlisted resource requests may be determined to change the construct of what is being assessed. Therefore, a student's score may be removed from aggregation, not be counted as participating for accountability, be invalidated for CAS, or assign the lowest attainable scale score for LPAC. The CD shall make a determination of whether the requested resources changes the construct being measured or, and will contact you if more information is needed to make this determination. If the CD reaches out to the LEA for more information, but the LEA does not respond within 10 days or they're at the end of their testing window, whichever is sooner, the CD will approve the request, but may conclude that the requested resource will change the construct of what is being assessed. Next is the update to the accessibility resources for all programs. First off, Print on Demand is a density support for LPAC and accommodation for CAS. Previously, LEAs and site coordinators would have to contact their success agent to turn on Print on Demand, but now it is test setting in TOMS. LEAs and site coordinators will be able to print on demand once the test setting has been turned on in TOMS. Bluetooth hearing aids have been added to the list as an allowable designated medical support for all programs. Medical devices that connect to cell phones or the internet should be monitored to ensure they are only used as a medical support and not, and not to access information online or to communicate with other students. Please note that Bluetooth headphones are still prohibited for general student testing. Here are the accessibility updates for Smart Balance English Language Arts, Literacy, or ELA, Mathematics, and Science. We are excited to announce that based on the feedback received from LEAs, embedded word prediction for single words as an accommodation is now available for Smart Balance ELA, Math, and Science. Previously, word prediction was only non-embedded and students using Chromebooks were not able to use this feature. Now embedded word prediction will allow students to begin writing a word and choose from a list of single words that have been predicted from word frequency and syntax rules. 
For Smart Balance ELA and Math, we've added non-embedded printed test directions in English as a designated support that allows a student to receive a printed copy of the oral test directions in English. In addition, we added non-embedded ASL test directions as a designated support. This, test, this support will have test directions, including test administrating scripts translated into ASL. The humans in the ASL human signer and assigned context test content are viewed in the same room. Students may view portions of the ASL video as often as needed. For Smarter Balance Math Only, the Spanish stack translation is now toggled between English and Spanish. Previously, a full translation of each test in Spanish was provided above the original question in English, as well as on on-screen directions in Spanish, including menus and buttons. Now a student can toggle between English and Spanish. It is still available as an embedded designate support. For LPAC, we've expanded the use of both the strike through and line reader universal tool for grade two for summative and initial LPAC, where the student may request a testing examiner to utilize these tools. The support is also available for the non-standardized administration of the LPAC interim assessment for grade two students. Now, we are excited to announce the test settings project. We have long discussed finding a way of setting resource settings from student information system, SIS, and special education system, SPEDS, to TOMS. We initially planned on using CalPASS as a vehicle to for transferring this information, but have recently worked with ETS to find another way that won't place a burden on CalPASS. LEAs currently have two options of assigning accessibility resources, which are the designated supports and accommodations in TOMS. They can either assign the one by one TOM in the TOMS user interface, or upload a file into TOMS for multiple students. In January of 2023, ETS started the development of a test setting application program interface or API that will allow SIS and SPED vendors to integrate the database of student accessibility resources that are used in TOMS. Vendors and LEAs tested the API in March and the operational deployment was released last month in July. The API facilitates a transfer of the, non, of the embedded and non-embedded designated supports and accommodation from the LEA, SIS, and SPED system into TOMS and vice versa. ETS is working on a plug-in module for selecting test settings for vendors to use in their system. The module should be ready for the 24-25 school year. The ZIS system of assigning test settings to, settings to students in TOMS will continue to be available for 23-24 testing year. When identifying vendors to participate in the pilot, a, large, a selection of large, medium, and small SIS vendors were selected along with some SPED vendors. SIS vendors participating in the pilots were, were ARIES, School Pathways, Equitas, and EdgePoint. SPED vendors using SACE and Cirrus, by and for vendors include Beyond SST. A tentative deployment for School Pathway, Equitas, EdgePoint, SACE, and Beyond SST is planned for this month, August, while ARIES and Cirrus plans deployment is set for September. If your vendor is not shown and you're interested in having this interface, you can reach out to your success agent and provide them with your vendor and contact information. Next is apportionment. Apportionment is provided to LEAs to reimburse the costs associated with administering the CAS and LPAC. The apportionment is verified in the 23-24 for the 22-23 administration year. All rates, including the initial alternate LPAC rate, were approved in May of 2023. All other CAS and LPAC rates for the 22-23 remain the same for the 21-22. More information regarding the rates can be found in your note-taking guide. Finally, a reminder that the Golden State SEAL Merit Diploma, or GSSMD, recognizes public school graduates who have demonstrated their mastery of the high school curriculum in at least six subject areas, four of which are English language arts, mathematics, science, and U.S. history, with the remaining two subject areas selected by the student. Each LEA that confers high school diplomas are required per California Education Code Section 51450-55 to maintain appropriate records in order to annually identify students who have earned a GSSMD and to affix the GSSMD exigna to the diploma and transcript for each qualifying student. GSSMD eligibility requirements that include a combination of qualifying smart balance assess summative assessment results course grades, and or results from assessments produced by prior pro private providers or LEAs for the use by LEA to award the GSSMD to graduating students. 
All documents on the GSSMD webpage will be updated in January for the 23-24 school year. LEA should take advantage of the earlier timeline to receive the GSSMD insignia for their eligible students. The CDE will begin mailing requested seals in February. Although there is no deadline for submitting the form, LEA should send their request far enough in advance of the date of the first graduation ceremony in the district to allow sufficient time for the CDE to process the request and for school staff to officiate the seals to diploma and transcript. More information can be found on the CDE website webpage that is listed in your note-taking guide. Thank you. Back to you, Amy. Thank you so much, Judy and Devin. I saw a lot of excitement out there about the Test Settings API project. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions already in our uh, Q&A uh, form. And I just wanted to remind you that if you ask questions about the LPAC or the CAST or interim assessments, those might be uh, answered next week. Um, so, and if you ask questions about accountability, that will be on the 17th. So we will hold on to those questions and answer them next time. Um, but we have lots of questions to answer at the end. But for now, we are going to go ahead to our next section about the CSA. So please welcome Anel Bravo, Education Programs Consultant in the English Language Proficiency and Spanish Assessments Office, here to share the updates about the CSAs. Anel, thank you. Take it away. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Amy. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Anel Bravo, and I'm an education programs consultant in the English Language Proficiency and Spanish Assessments Office at the California Department of Education. Today, I'll be sharing updates on the California Spanish Assessment. So today's during today's presentation, I'll be sharing information and updates on the following topics. A brief overview and purpose of the California Spanish Assessment, or CSA, exciting updates to the expansion process, information on the CSA usability pilot conducted as a part of the expansion, information about the upcoming field tests, and finally, information on upcoming educator opportunities. So I'm gonna start off with a quick overview of the CSA. The CSA became operational in spring of 2019, and it's aligned with the Common Core State Standards in Espanol. These are a translation of the English Language Arts Common Core State Standards, and include an augmented portion to address unique elements of the Spanish language that are not present in the English language. It is an optional computer-based assessment, meaning LEAs are the ones that make the decision about whether or not to participate. Last year, the CSA was administered to just over 55,000 students, which is almost 10,000 more than the previous year. The CSA currently assesses listening, reading, and writing mechanics. There is an assessment for each of the grades three through eight, and then there is one assessment for students in grades nine through 12. Note that for students at the high school level, they can take the CSA up to one time per year during high school. So the CSA has three purposes that were included in the high level test design that was approved by the State Board of Education or SBE in September of 2016, which are to measure a student's knowledge and skills in Spanish reading language arts and provide student level data in Spanish literacy, evaluate the implementation of Spanish language arts programs at the local level, not at the state level, and to provide a high school measure suitable to be used in part for the state seal of biliteracy. Please note that currently this, the state seal of biliteracy requires speaking and writing that includes full write essays to be eligible to be used in part. In November of 2021, the SBE approved the new California Assessment System contract with ETS, our contractor. This contract included the development of the speaking domain and the expansion of the writing domain, which could be used to meet requirements for the state seal by literacy once operational and approved by the legislature. So we are currently develop developing the expansion, which I will discuss next. So we've been working really hard on the expansion of the, of the CSA and we're excited to share our progress. In November of 2022, the high level test design addendum, revisions to test blueprints and revisions to the general achievement level descriptors were presented and approved by the State Board of Education. 
All of these materials identified that the speaking and writing would be integrated into the other CSA items to minimize the burden on our students and educators. The revised test blueprints include an adjustment of the number of items, which has a small increase from 52 items to 56 items. Eight speaking items will be included, which will be worth one to two points each. Corresponding rubrics, rubrics have been developed and reviewed in collaboration with our educators. After the approval of these materials, our testing contractor has gone through our rigorous item development process for the new speaking and full write items with educators this past spring. These items will be field tested during the 22-23-24 administration. So now I'm gonna discuss the next phase of the expansion of the CSA, which, was, um, which is a CSA usability pilot. So after the approval of the high-level test design addendum, our next step was to ensure that our plan for integrating speaking into the CSA would be successful. To do this, we conducted a usability pilot with our partners ETS and the Sacramento County Office of Education. So who would be participating in the CSA usability pilot? It was a group of third grade, sixth grade, and high school students. Next is the what, which is the group administration of the newly developed CSA speaking items. A small set of speaking items were administered in a group setting to the grades identified. This occurred in the spring of 2023, which is the when. Where it was located was at several schools in the San Juan Unified School District. We are very appreciative to our partners at San Juan Unified who allowed us to conduct this usability pilot at their schools. Finally, the why. To reduce the burden on both students and test administrators, the goal of the pilot was to confirm that the group administration of the speaking domain could be done successfully. So as a result of the usability pilot, here are some, here are some recommendations for the CSA field test regarding group administration of the speaking item. So educators should provide students with an opportunity to practice recording their responses in the new training test ahead of time so that they become familiar with the interface. This new training test should be released in the fall. Students should also have an opportunity to take the training test so that they become familiar with, their, with the other item types. In the usability pilot, students were asked to listen to prompts and then asked to respond using different technology and settings. One of the ways was to use a computer's microphone to capture the response. Another way was to use headsets with built-in microphones. So it was found that responses where students use a headset with a built-in microphone were clearer and easier for a test administrator to score. During the pilot, students were able to use the notepad in the test delivery system. They, they provided feedback that scratch paper would also be useful to help take notes and brainstorm their responses before responding. So, so the use of, of scratch paper is encouraged. Another scenario allowed the use of student dividers or partitions. The use of student dividers was helpful in creating a sense of privacy and helped students provide clearer responses. We hope that these recommendations will allow for the smooth administration of the 2023-24 CSA field test. Now let's discuss the who, what, when, where, and why of the 2023-24 CSA field test. Who will participate and what, what will they be doing? So it'll be all registered students taking the CSA will be field testing the newly, newly developed speaking and full write items. Since the field test items are embedded into the test, all students who take the CSA will be participating. All questions must have a response in order to move on to the next segment of the test. When will this occur? This will occur in spring of 2024 during your administration window. Now let's dig into the why. So the purpose of field testing items is to evaluate their measurement properties, quality, and fairness prior to use on an operational test. Once field tested items are reviewed and approved, they would be eligible to be placed on a future operational test. Additionally, with the integration of the speaking items in the field test, we are including a cover page in both Spanish and English that provides detailed instructions on how to respond in the test delivery system. 
These will appear before each segment. For the field test, the testing contractor will score both the speaking and writing constructed response items. Once they become operational, speaking will be scored locally by educators and writing will be scored by the testing contractor. All students will continue to receive an overall score reporting range for the, for the student in 2023-24. No individual scores for speaking or writing constructed responses will be provided and LEAs will not receive field test results. To support the upcoming field test, the training test will be updated in order to allow test administrators and students to become familiar with the newly developed item types. We will be releasing a flyer that outlines all the new features of the new CSA training test. So you can find these links in the note-taking guide. There will also be new videos released to support the administration of field test items. Some ad additional changes to the field test include the total testing time. With the much needed inclusion of the speaking and full write items, the total amount of time to administer the test will increase. Estimates will be included in the CASP online test administration manual when it is released. We're really excited to share the status of the expansion of the CSA and we're really looking forward to next year's field test. So it's always very important to include educators to get their feedback as they are on the front lines with students' dailies. Some of the meetings that will be coming up in the next year or so are item writer workshops in which participants will receive training on how to write assessment items and, and learn about opportunities to write items for, for use in future versions of the CSA, item review meetings in which participants will review passages and items for issues related to content, bias, and sensitivity, that may affect performance of particular groups of students. And data review meetings with, during which participants review the performance of field test items to, to determine if they can become operational. I've included a link in the note-taking guide to the CASP Opportunities to Get Involved webpage on the CASP website. This page is kept up to date with upcoming opportunities for educator participation. Thank you. Uh, now I'll pass it back to Amy. Thank you, Anel. That was great. Now uh, we are pleased to hear all about the CASP ELA and math assessments from Scott Fitzgerald, Education Programs Consultant from the ELA and Mathematics Office. Scott, go ahead. Thanks, Amy, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for sticking with us to the very end here. Uh, as Amy mentioned, my name is uh, Scott Fitzgerald and I work in the ELA and Math Office here in the Assessment Division. Uh, today, I'll be sharing some information and updates uh, as it relates to the ELA and Math portion of the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress. Go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, so taking a look at our agenda for today, um, we will be discussing some general updates, including information on the adjusted form blueprints, um, the return of target reporting, uh, composite claims, the inclusion of Lexile Quantile scores on interim assessments. And then we'll also be discussing um, some information regarding the 1% survey and then taking a look at some additional resources. So we'll go ahead and jump right into the uh, updates we have for you today. Um, and in regards to blueprints, uh, California will continue to use uh, the adjusted form blueprints for smarter balanced ELA and mathematics uh, for the 2023 24 uh, administration. Uh, and as a reminder, with the adjusted uh, uh, blueprint, the computer adaptive portion of the test is reduced by approximately 50%, uh, while the performance task portion remains unchanged uh, when compared to the full form blueprints that were used uh, in 2018, 2019, and earlier. Um, the 2023 20, uh, 20, 20, 24 blueprints remain unchanged from last year's administration uh, and can be found on the Smarter Content Explorer, uh, of which there is a link provided for you in your note-taking guide. Uh, in addition, while the tests are untimed, uh, a table of estimated testing times uh, with the adjusted blueprint can be found in the online test administration manual, uh, and there is also a link for that in your note-taking guide as well. So moving on to target reporting. Um, as a reminder, an assessment target uh, defines the grade-specific knowledge, skill, 
or ability that students should know or be able to demonstrate within a, within a domain in either ELA or mathematics. Uh, a target may be associated with one or more multiple standards um, and the target reports provide additional information about groups of students. Uh, unlike the overall ELA or mathematics score, uh, the assessment target reports do not address absolute performance. Uh, rather, the reports uh, provide two relative indicators of performance, uh, the first being performance relative to the entire test uh, and two performance relative to MET standard. Uh, target reports are once again available in the California Educator Report, uh, Reporting System, so known as SERVs, um, starting with the 2022-23 administration. Uh, target reports were suspended in 2019-2020 due to factors surrounding uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and then uh, were further suspended in 2020-21 and 21-22 as the CDE needed this time to perform analysis uh, to really confirm that the adjusted blueprints contained a, significant, a sufficient number of items uh, to generate valid target reports. Uh, users can find target reports in SERS. Uh, target reports are only available for student groups of 30 or more uh, and for targets with more than 10 questions in the item bank. Uh, an FAQ for target reports has been updated. It is linked in your note-taking guide. Uh, next up, we'll talk a little bit about Lexion Quantile. Uh, as you may know, Lexion Quantile measures uh, are already available for Smarter Balance summative assessments, uh, and they are available in SERS, uh, on the individual student score reports, uh, and also in the student score data file. However, um, they are now available for students who take a Smarter Balanced Interim Comprehensive Assessment, also known as an ICA, uh, for English Language Arts, Literacy, or Mathematics. Uh, and Lexile Quantile measures from the ICAs are only available for individual students in the California Educator Reporting System. So last up on our updates uh, is information regarding uh, composite claims. So in May of 2023, the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium confirmed uh, the reporting of composite claim results for the ELA and Mathematics Adjusted Form Blueprint. Uh, so pending State Board of Education approval, 2023-24 CASP SSR will include a section focused on the Smarter Balanced Summative Assessments for ELA and Mathematics Composite Claim Results. Uh, composite claim results will be reported using the same performance levels as the individual claim results. So once again, that's below standard, near standard, and above standard. Uh, and as a reminder, near standard means that a student's performance was either at standard, slightly above standard, or slightly below standard for that specific performance area of the assessment. Uh, for ELA, the current reading and listening claims will be combined into a single reading and listening composite claim that measures how will students understand written and spoken information, while the writing and research claims will be combined into a single uh, to a single writing and research composite claim that measures how well students uh, use research skills and communicate in writing. For mathematics, uh, the concepts and procedures claim will remain as is uh, and will still measure how well students apply mathematical concepts and procedures to solve problems, while the other three claims will be combined into a single mathematical practices composite claim that measures how well students explain reasoning and apply strategies to solve complex problems. Starting with the 2023-24 results, uh, the CDE will report aggregate composite claim results for student groups of 11 or more on the test results for California's assessment website. Uh, and a link for the TRCA website has been placed in your note-taking guide. Um, and lastly, aggregate results for individual claims will continue to be available for student groups of 30 or more. So next we'll talk a little bit about um, the 1% survey. Uh, and to provide a little bit of background here, uh, the Every Student Succeed Act requires LEAs to notify the California Department of Education if they expect to exceed 1% of their total assessed student population, taking alternative assessments, and to provide the justification 
for surpassing that threshold. So this is important to note that the CDE requires all California LEAs to report if they anticipate exceeding the 1%, uh, not exceeding the 1%, or has no students expected to take the California alternate assessments. Uh, LEAs that anticipate exceeding the 1% cap must provide a justification as to why the LEA expects to exceed this cap. There are two justifications to select from. Uh, the first being you are a small LEA or a single school district and have a small number of students, which would impact the, over, the overall LEA threshold. And then secondarily, um, there are specialized programs within your LEA, uh, and this could include classroom programs, um, specialized medical facilities, and uh, foster residential programs. Um, and then once again, for more information regarding the 1% survey, please consult uh, your note-taking guide. And then moving along, um, the certification at the end of the survey must be completed by all LEAs, regardless of whether the LEA has any students identified to take the CAA. Uh, the certification indicates that the LEA has ensured that the LEA's educators have been trained on the state's guidelines and confirms that individual education program teams are adhering to the state's identified criteria of eligibility in making participation decisions for students who participate in the CAAs. It contains three assurances. The first being, any students identified for alternate assessment within the LEA have been determined to be the most significantly cognitively impaired, including factors related to cognitive functioning and adaptive behavior. Two, any students identified for alternate, alternate assessment have been shown to require extensive, direct individual instruction and substantial supports to achieve measurable gains on the challenging state alternate academic achievement content standards for the grade in which the student is enrolled. And then three, students with the most significant cognitive disabilities are not identified solely on the basis of the student's previous low academic achievement or the student's previous need for accommodations to participate in general state or district-wide assessments. Uh, the penalty for exceeding the 1% cap is solely to the state, uh, not the individual LEAs. So LEAs are not penalized for indicating in the survey that they expect to exceed the 1%. LEAs that continue to exceed the 1% cap may be identified for monitoring by the Special Education Division since continued LEA overage is now considered in the identification rubric for compliance and improved monitoring by the Special Education Division. Uh, and then on to additional resources here. Um, you know, lastly, we wanted to provide some additional resources for the content that we've covered today. Uh, these items and links are available in your note-taking guide. Uh, first, the Smarter Content Explorer test development webpage contains the adjusted blueprints for the summative and interim assessments, as well as all other test development-related documentation. Uh, also, the newly updated assessment target reports frequently asked questions document provides information on target reporting. Um, the Lexile Quantile Framework and Measures webpage on the CDE website provides an overview of Lexile and Quantile measures and includes additional resources. And then lastly, uh, the 1% threshold on alternative, on alternative assessments webpage contains information on the survey in the results of previous year's surveys. So uh, that wraps it up for the ELA and math portion of today's meeting. Um, I wanna thank you again, thank everyone again for making it through with us to the end. And uh, I believe Amy, unless you have anything else, we have, we've now entered the Q and A section of today's meeting. We have Scott, thank you so much. Um, I know that our team behind the scenes has been busily looking at all of your hundred plus questions that have come in over today. Um, we have a little less than a half hour to answer those questions. So we will get to as many of them as we possibly can. Um, and I believe we're gonna start off with Don's office. Don, do you see a couple of questions there you'd like to start off with? Sure do, uh, thanks Amy. First question is, what's the difference for students in the proficiency and equivalency test? Why take one over the other? Um, <laughs> the difference really is the eligibility. A student is only eligible to take proficiency test if they are enrolled in high school. 
They must be enrolled in high school. The per, uh, equivalency tests are for those students who are no longer in high school and are coming back and trying to get an equivalent to a high school diploma. Um, so that's the difference. There is no difference in the tests other than uh, the scoring portion. Uh, in order to pass a proficiency test, you must pass at the college and career ready cut score, uh, which I talked about earlier. And then for equivalency, there is a, uh, a lower bar, which is the equivalency cut score. Uh, Mr. Kilmer states, next question. Mr. Kilmer stated that uh, the test is available in English or Spanish, but the student must select the language at the beginning. Was this for proficiency or equivalency or both? It is available for both. That is the new benefit to uh, taking a uh, equivalency, uh, excuse me, taking a proficiency test using the equivalency test. Uh, you can select at the time of testing the mode, meaning paper, pencil, or computer-based, the location, either in a testing center for computer-based testing um, or paper-based testing, or uh, at home using a computer-based testing, and you can select whether it be in Spanish or in English. Uh, so that's the new benefit for using uh, high school equivalency tests to test high school proficiency. Uh, next question. Are students who earn a certificate of proficiency uh, or equivalency eligible to apply for financial aid through FAFSA? Yes. Uh, uh, students who uh, pass the equivalency test, uh, they both high set and GED uh, results are, uh, are make the student eligible to receive uh, FAFSA designation as well as the California Chespi test. Um, uh, so that being said, uh, because we have not yet uh, begun testing with uh, proficiency uh, using the high school equivalency test, we have not had that conversation with the Federal Department of Education. Uh, that conversation uh, should conclude with the same result, but um, until we have had that conversation and that finding is posted, uh, Chespi, yes. High school equivalency, high set GED, yes. Uh, high school proficiency using high set or GED, um, yet to be determined. Uh, the next question, and these are two PFT questions. Um, I know that PFT scores are no longer in a cumulative folder. Do we need to provide proof of participation in the PFT in the student's cumulative folder? Uh, this was the direction last year's testing. Uh, there is no requirement any longer to put anything in the student's cumulative folder with regards to physical fitness testing. Uh, the requirement is that participation is collected and reported in the student's SARC, uh, or excuse me, in the school's SARC. Uh, so if that's unclear, uh, uh, please contact the Department of Ed. Uh, this is a relatively new change. It was part of the regulations that were approved by the state board earlier uh, this year or the end of last year. I apologize, I can't remember. Um, uh, when will there be a new PFT requirements? Uh, there are, I'm assuming you're referring to um, when will there be a new test? Uh, and the answer to that question is uh, there won't be a new test until there's a new law and new funding. Uh, so we will continue doing uh, the uh, fitness gram as part of the PF as the PFT until we uh, until we notify you that we're no longer doing that. So continue doing exactly what you're doing. Uh, the 22, 23 uh, testing will mirror what we do in 23-24. So I got a brand new question. Uh, did you say the certificate for completion is accepted at CSU and UC? Uh, I've always been under the impression that it did not. Um, so uh, if you're talking about a proficiency certificate, 
uh, a proficiency certificate or the CHESPE certificate is, um, is required by law to be accepted by all state colleges, C, uh, UC, CSU, and all state junior colleges. Um, the high school equivalency certificate is accepted by all those as well as other universities, other state universities outside of California and internationally. Uh, Amy, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Why don't we go ahead and hand it off to the folks who did the updates across programs? I think um, Chad Portney, our manager from our ELA and mathematics office, is going to take those. Chad? Thanks, Amy. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have a few questions on updates across program, and I may be calling out some of my uh, CD colleagues for help. I'd also like to take a moment to thank my ETS colleagues who are working in the background to help us answer these questions. Um, first question is, when will updated resources be released uh, for accessibility matrix, graphics, updated, and new videos? The matrix and the accessibility graphics are being updated and will be available in September. The updated resource videos will be available this fall. Next question is, when I download and print student store reports, they do not come out in alphabetical order. Is it possible to have them print in alphabetical order? For the bulk download of student score reports or SSRs, the store order is by uh, statewide student identifier SID. The file names don't contain the student name. Um, the store order for the merged SSR download file, which merges all the SSRs into a single PDF for ease in printing, has changed to incorporate alpha order for 2223. Uh, the store order for the merge file is LEA, school, grade, student name, and then some other things. So we will bring this back to ETS and discuss the possibility of a way to create that alpha order in the bulk download. Third question is, any thoughts as to when the issue will be resolved for downloading version 16 of the secure browser for Windows? We've got 36,000 plus student devices that need to receive v16, which might take a few months for the deployment to be successful. The issue uh, that's being cited will be resolved in the next two weeks, and ETS will announce a resolution date prior to the deployment of the new Windows Secure Browser. And I'll take one more, and then I'll pass it on. I've learned that scores are only being added to the Tom student score data file once the SSR is generated, even if those scores are already available in search. The approach is frustrating and delays our team's ability to perform analysis and goal study. The new setup is forcing entry of SSR availability dates before downloading the file. It is also a source of frustration because for charter organizations, we must perform this process for each separate LEA. Can the SSRs in the student score data file be uncoupled? Can the requirement of entering SSR dates be removed? So I we really appreciate this feedback. It's very valuable to us, and we're definitely going to discuss this concern with ETS uh, to see if it is possible to implement a different method. This change was essentially made in response to LEA requests to make the CAS student score data file functionality similar to the LPAC and allow for daily updates. But as I said, we'll research what options are available. Amy, I'll go ahead and pass it on and wait for my, for my next one. Sure. Let's go ahead and pass things back to Anel and Tracy Albee from the LPAC office. Thank you, Amy. Um, I have a couple that I'll start off with. And so first one, when will the CSA be authorized to, you, to use towards the criteria for the state seal of biliteracy? Um, so the CSA will be eligible for meeting the state seal of biliteracy once it's operational and the State Board of Education has approved thresholds and scores. From there, uh, the legislature will need to add this as a new assessment in part to meet California Education Code Section 51. 461 requirements. So we still have a little bit to go, um, but you know we, we we hear you that you're excited to, to be able to use this. But it's we, we still need to com complete a couple more steps before that that's possible. So next one, okay. Next one. How do we decide who should take the CSA? We are a K eight district with no bilingual program. So the CSA is in, an assessment. Um, available to any student um, at a California public school who is seeking a measure of their Spanish reading language art skill or is receiving instruction in Spanish. Um, so any student who falls 
falls in that category could, could take the CSA. And then let me see if there's anyone for me. Okay, so um, next one for me. So last year we had to physically assign each student the CSA. Is there a way for the whole school site um, to be assigned easily? Um, you have two Spanish dual language academies if, that they want all of the, the um, if you're taking the CAS to take the CSA. So you should be able to do a bulk upload test assignment for CSA in TOMS. Um, if, if you have trouble doing that, you can reach out, reach out to, um, to your success agent and they should be able to help you um, do that. And let me see if another one. Okay, um, last one for me and then I'll pass it on to Tracy. So if headsets with mics are required for field testing during the speaking testing, will we still need them when we're out of field testing and local staff will score this domain? So um, yes, it's, it's, it's encouraged that you use um, headsets that have a built-in microphone. And we, you know, this will continue as the CSA is being expanded to include the speaking domain. Um, local staff will, will score the speaking responses for the students. And per the approved expanded blueprint, there will be eight short speaking responses per student. The pilot demonstrated that the audio recordings were clearer for those students who use the headsets with the microphones built in. So for ease of use for, for the scorer, it, it was really beneficial to use the mics with the built-in um, or the headsets with the built-in mics. So that's it for me. I'll pass it over to Tracy. Uh, thanks, Anel. Hi, I'm Tracy Albe. I'm an administrator of the English Language Proficiency and Spanish Assessments Office here at the CDE. Um, the question I have is, is there a possibility for the new CSA group speaking administration feature to be used for the LPAC speaking domain? The CDE could hire scores that would lead to better standardization of scoring. It would take pressure off of schools. Um, thank you for that suggestion, but uh, no, <laughs> there is no plan to change the way of scoring. Um, primarily, um, as we want to ensure that the students are prompted when necessary, and by only allowing the students to do this on their own, that doesn't mean that they will actually do that. Um, the LPAC tests measures a student's proficiency also, whereas the CSA measures a student's comprehension of content. Um, we also allow on the CSA for a student to re-record the responses, whereas a student on the LPAC is um, given the opportunity to respond, they may be asked again for um, to tell us more information, and then that is how they are scored. Um, and additionally, the CSA scoring of speaking um, will be done by ETS or um, by ETS is only for the field test year. Test administrators will need to score the speaking beginning in the 24-25 administration year. Next question, uh, would it be possible to get the CSA directions also in English? I do not speak Spanish and it is difficult to answer questions when I am not able to understand what is being asked. So uh, we will look into translating the test directions in the online test administration manual for this year. It may not be embedded in the manual, but we may look to, to do some sort of um, companion um, document. And then finally, um, please, as soon as possible, release CSA resources and staff training tools for the upcoming field test. Uh, we need to know what will be needed to provide staff training as well as to help sites prepare for this, including technology requirements. The flyer is new from today's note-taking guide. However, the resources on the PowerPoint webpage were posted back in 2021. Thank you. Uh, we are currently updating the CSA web pages, um, but to let you know, we will be providing a lot more information when we release the online test administration manual, which is usually just before the testing window opens. But we are also developing a preparing for administration document, which will be earlier this fall. And then also for the upcoming year, the only different technology requirement will be a microphone from last year to this year. Uh, they may be built into your uh, laptops, Chromebooks, as you would normally use for LPAC, or you may buy separate ones which have the microphone um, uh, built into the headsets. Uh, we are also going to be releasing an updated training test, which contains the new speaking and full write item types, um, along with scoring rubrics early this fall. 
So um, please look for these. And again, we will be sending out communications to districts um, as these resources come available. And back to you, Amy. All right, it looks like we are going over to Devin and Chad for some ELA and math questions. Devin? Thanks, Amy. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, continue with um, some, some ELA and math questions. Um, let me go back to our sheet. Okay, so our first um, question is, when will the CASP score, CASP score file have all results for ELA and math? SERS shows around 30 to 50 students more in math at each grade level compared to the score file. And the assumption is these are ELA exempt EL students who won't have an ELA score. At what point will an SSR be issued for them so their math scores are included in the file? And in short, ETS is still completing scoring for 22-23. They are still processing students who did not test and those students will appear in the file soon. The, file data, the final data file will include uh, with all students will be available in mid-September. Uh, next question is, will LEAs uh, still be allowed to administer the CASP uh, virtually or remotely in spring 2024? And the answer is yes, remote administration continues to be available in 23-24 for students in a remote learning situation. So students receiving remote instruction can also take the assessment through a remote administration. Next question is, when will claim level data be released? Um, a claim level data uh, will be, or aggregate claim data will be released with the release of the 22-23 results on the uh, test results for California's assessments website, a public release uh, late, to occur later this fall. LEAs will have a preview of these results in October. Again, uh, aggregate claim results will be for student groups of 30 or more. Um, and um, individual claim results are still not available with the adjusted blueprint. Um, however, it is planned that for 23-24, um, composite claim results will be available on SSRs and on the public reporting website. Um, next question is, please clarify that the enrolled by student score data file will be updated da uh, daily. And, um, <clears throat> And that is correct. The, the file was updated based on LEA requests. So the enrolled by file is now updated daily to reflect students currently en enrolled in the LEA and students who tested in the LEA and have since moved out. Uh, keep in mind that the enrolled by file will only be updated with the latest information that was up uploaded in the LEA's latest CalPads update. Um, next question is, will the CASP ELA math, um, will the Smarter Balance assessments use the full blueprint and California will continue to use the adjusted blueprint for the 23-24 administration. Uh, the testing times for these tests have not changed. Uh, to clarify something I was talking about earlier in regards to stairs. Um, so I mentioned that if a student encounters a technical issue while testing that you should have the student stop testing and not allow them to continue until the issue has been resolved. And so the question is, will grace period extensions be granted for students if troubleshooting results troubleshooting results in the expiration of the 20 minute pause rule? And the answer is yes, the grace period extensions will be granted in situations where uh, a technical issue occurs that is outside the control of the test administrator or test examiner and this um, would qualify. Um, the next question is, what does the student's test is invalidated mean? So what, what, what does it mean when a student's test is invalidated? Uh, this means that the score is con considered invalid for reasons of public aggregations and for inclusion in the California School Accountability Dashboard. Students will still receive their score on their student score report with a footnote that um, informs the reader to use the score with caution. However, that score will not be considered valid for aggregations on the test results for California's assessments website, and it, it will not be treated as a valid score for the California School Dashboard. Um, I'm going to answer two more questions and then, or just one more question and pass it on. What is the timeline for the cast results to be sent to the LEAs for review and then released to the public? Uh, the LEA preview of final results for CASP and LPAC is planned for October, and you will receive a letter soon from um, Deputy Superintendent Cotton with this information. Um, and then following the LEA preview of results will occur the uh, public release uh, later in the fall. Uh, 
Okay, thank you. I'll pass it back to Amy. All right, it uh, looks like we have maybe time for one or two more questions. Um, Chad, was there anything left over that you wanted to answer? I'm actually going to ask Judy to step in and answer a couple of accessibility questions. All right, Judy. Okay, so we have a question about is there a design support or accommodation decision making tool available available for districts to determine which supports would be most helpful for students. And, you know, we do have the individual student assessment accessibility profile or the ISAP tool, I-S-A-A-P, which can help with matching accessibility resources with your student needs. We also have an accessibility training series that's available online that provides some guidance on matching accessibility resources to meet student needs. Um, you, can, you can access that at the cast.org website. Um, we have a couple questions about the um, API. Um, if your vendor, you want your vendor to be participate, please just contact your success agent. Um, we will reach out to, um, I think, Willigent, Willigent. Um, but just letting you know, if you want to participate, please let your success agent know and they'll contact ETS. Um, this does say API means the test says accommodation will be automatically populated in TOMS. What's the expected release date for SAIS API? And yes, this will allow test settings to be transmitted directly into TOMS. SAIS plans to have this functionality available by the end of this month, but SAIS will reach out to their LEAs for further information. Um, This for proposed APIs between SAIS and Tom, SIS, SAIS and TOMS, what happens to students with an IEP of 504 who needs to turn on designated supports? Are we able to upload test settings the traditional way? What happens for students with both API test settings and designated supports that are assigned from non IEP 504 scenarios? Will the daily API override anything uploaded manually? So, LEAs and site coordinators will still have the ability to add dozen supports and accommodations to students on top of the API pipeline, which means you can still go into TOMS and upload the test settings the traditional way. Um, vendors will be working with LEAs to assist them in understanding how the information will be received and used. The updates that are decided on the vendors will, we will be, the updates will be decided on the vendors and we'll be adding information on the cast.org or lpac.org websites. We're also looking at issues of LEAs using multiple vendors to update information and more information will be coming. But the do API do have the option to update, delete, um, to view, um, update, delete, view, or to clear out. So they do have the option to update instead of just overriding everything. Um, let's see, please, oh, we, again, we will not be taking away any of the current options to, to upload test settings. So you still up, can upload with a Tom user user interface, or you can still do a batch upload using Tom's. Uh, one more thing to add is that we do have embedded word prediction. And then we have a question. We have dual language institute sites where we turn on stack translations for all students as a designated support. How would this be affected in the automatic API? Should we move forward with it? What happens to students who have non-IEP associate designated supports, as well as various accommodation as text-to-speech? Test settings can be uploaded to TOMS using batch upload again, or by one-on-one -on -one TOMS on long with the new API. So you have a choice to do, you can do both. You can't, you don't have to commit to one. So you can actually do the upload and um, use the API. Thank you. Great, thank you, Judy. Well, I think that we have answered a lot of questions, but if your question wasn't answered today, do not despair. Uh, if you included your email with the Q&A form, we'll be reaching out to you with answers to your questions. Um, and if you asked about one of our upcoming topics, you may hear the answer at one of our upcoming sessions. Um, we will be loading the PowerPoint into the same folder where you found your note-taking guide after this meeting, so we're sure to give you the most updated PowerPoint. Um, and the video of this presentation will be available in a week or two on the cast.org asynchronous training page. And with that, we would like you to join us for our upcoming AIM dates. Uh, they're every Thursday through August 17th. On August 10th, we will cover the updates for the California Science Test, the LPAC assessments, and the interim assessments. 
And then on the 17th, uh, that session will be devoted to accountability. Uh, these dates, as well as the content covered, are listed in your note-taking guide. We also wanted to let you know about our upcoming conference. The California Assessment Conference is designed especially for classroom teachers and site administrators. The CAC, as we call it, will be held in person this year, October 9th and 10th in Sacramento. In addition, the key, uh, key information about assessment topics, this conference will feature many local educational agencies who will share their best practices. The link to the CAC website is in your note-taking guide. Please help us spread the word and get teachers registered for this great event. So pass that on to all your folks. Uh, we would like to also remind you that later today, actually I was told that may have already been sent to your inboxes, um, you'll be getting the assessment coordinator survey. If you didn't get it, make sure uh, you check your spam folder just in case it happened to go there uh, because we really need your feedback. It's important to us because it helps us provide resources and trainings that fit your needs and we really encourage you to fill that out. If you need to contact us, just a reminder that the contact contact links to all of our assessment division program offices are included in your note-taking guide, as well as links to, to subscribe to the assessment spotlight and Twitter, and I believe Instagram also now. And that brings us to the end of our meeting. We hope that the information that we shared today was helpful and timely. As always, we want to remind you that we are your collaborators and partners in this work. You can reach out through the networks of coordinators and similar roles throughout the state, and you always have the staff at the CDE ready and available to answer your questions. We will be sending out a post-meeting survey at the end of this meeting um, and at the end of each of our sessions. So if you could take a minute to complete that short uh, survey for each session, we would really appreciate it. As always, uh, we are looking to improve this meeting. And with that, thank you for joining us and please reach out if you have any questions. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye everyone.